Excuse me. All right, chemistry 3111. Let's try some more practice on chapter 16. So this first question says, predict the possible products for the following reaction and provide a curved arrow mechanism uh, for the formation of the products. So we'll start out with redrawing HBr. You cannot use a condensed structure of HBr like this to do a mechanism. You've got to show the sigma bond between the hydrogen and the bromine. So we're going to start out by making an allylic carbocation, and that's going to mean we're going to draw a curved arrow like this and like this. Let's draw that allylic carbocation, which is going to look something like this. And of course, we have a resonance form of that. We could draw the curved arrow like this. So we end up with something that looks like this. What do you notice about those two resonance forms? You're going to end up with the same compound either way, right? When you get a nucleophilic attack on that, okay? So it, the the resonance form is neither here nor there, really. Um, are you, does everybody see what I mean by that? That those are the, the, if you have, get a nucleophilic attack on both of those, which is going to give you a racemic mixture, you'd end up with the same racemic mixture in both cases. Okay, good. All right. So just in the interest of space, I'm just going to scribble kind of the answer to this one off to the side. So we've got the bromide. I'm going to delete this curved arrow and say the bromide is going to come in and attack here, or it could attack here, doesn't matter. And you're going to end up with only one product in this case, which is going to be this. And of course, it is going to be a racemic mixture. All right, so that's one product that you would get. And let's draw the other possible allylic carbocation. So I'm going to redraw the starting material like so. And we'll draw our HBr molecule, and we'll draw the other possible allylic carbocation. So put the proton here, and that's going to give us this. So we end up with our positive charge here. There we go. And we can draw the resonance form of that, and that's going to look like this so we end up with a positive charge here in our gem dimethyl i didn't draw the curved arrow but the curved arrow would look like that all right so those are our two resonance forms i'm going to delete the curved arrow put in my square brackets and of course the bromide can attack either of those positive charges so we'll put bromide here and a bromide here i should I should draw in the lone pair, shouldn't I? Sorry, that was my wife calling me. You see me? Let me just remind her that I'm in teaching a class. I think that, anyhow. Yeah. All right, can everybody still see the slide? I think you can. Yes? All right, good. Just thanks, Audrey, appreciate it. All right, put our negative charge in here. There we go, something like that. And then we could draw our curved arrow like this or like this. And we end up with our two other products, which look like this. There we go. There we go. And of course, this one is going to be racemic. And then, of course, we're going to end up with another racemic mixture here. There. Sorry, I have a hard time drawing good straight lines at the bottom of my iPad. Yeah, and of course, this is racemic as well. So we end up with a total of one racemic mixture, two racemic mixtures, and three racemic mixtures. So we get three racemic compounds. Give me a thumbs up if you're even like, I don't know, 50% of the way with me on this. Because I know everybody's got a lot on their plate at the moment. So you're going to definitely have to try this on your own time great good to, to really nail this stuff the next one nothing is easy in organic chemistry but the next one um it's done at zero degrees celsius and it's a symmetrical diene and so could anybody tell me they're asking for the major product in this reaction if i do the reaction at zero degrees celsius is the major product going to be the kinetic product or the thermodynamic product in this case Yes, thank you. Absolutely. It's going to be the kinetic product. Kinetic 
And is that going to be the one, two adduct or the one, four adduct? Absolutely. Yes, it's the one, two adduct. That's right. So let me, oops, let me scribble in here. Uh, one, two adduct. And they're just asking for the major product. So let's just draw that. And we'll draw a little mechanism here. Got time. Let's do it. So we do our proton transfer like this. And we end up with our allylic carbocation. And it, since it's the one, two adduct, our chloride is going to act as a nucleophile and it's going to attack here. There's no stereocenter to even worry about in this case. Right, and we just end up with this compound. So we get the one, two adduct. There we go. And again, there's no stereocenter to even consider here. So we're all good there. All right, let's move on to question number three. It's practically over. Hey, what do you know? It's the same question, but now they're asking us about the one, four adduct. No problem. So something in the same vein, you know, let's just skip the first step and we'll just go right to drawing. Why don't we just draw uh, the carbocation or the, let's just copy this down and we'll paste it over here since we already did that in the last problem. I'll just delete this arrow. There we go. So remember now we're at 40 degrees Celsius. So it's going to be the thermodynamic product and that's the one four adduct. And so now we have to draw the resonance form like this. Okay. And that's going to look a little something like this. Oops. Clean that up. We have a positive charge here. There we go. Okay. And our nucleophile is going to attack in the fourth position, right? Again, if you count one, two, three, four, we have one, two, three, four. We already added the proton at carbon one. And so now our chloride is going to come in at carbon number four, where the positive charge is here. So it's going to do something like that. And we're going to end up with this molecule. So we don't really have enough space here. So it's going to look something like this. There we go. And there we go. All right. So there you go. One, four addict since we're at high temperature. The next one, again, same rationale here. We want to uh, make a thermodynamic product. Why? Because we're at 40 degrees Celsius. And so let's practice our curved arrows. We have our HBr molecule, this. We're going to make our allylic carbocation. So let's draw that. You know what? Let's try this. Oh, that's a five member ring. How do I make a hexagon with the iPad? Anybody know? Oh, it doesn't want to help me. All right, anyhow, it was worth a shot. No, it doesn't work. Okay, where was I? Uh, let's see here. Um, so I protonated up at the top, so I have my carbo cation here. Oops, carbo cation here, like this. And it's going to have a resonance form, which is going to look like this. So, a resonance form is going to look like this. There we go. Put my positive charge down here. And now my bromide, since it's the one for adduct, it's going to come down here. Oops, wrong place. There we go. And so we're going to end up with a racemic mixture, of course, because the carbocation is trigonal planar. There we go. And this is going to be racemic. And again, we're ending up with the thermodynamic and, or one four adduct in this case. And the reason why you end up with this product this is thermodynamic is that you end up with the most substituted alkene alkene which is going to be more stable than the than the um tri substituted alkene right this one is tetra substituted okie doke there we go so that's some good practice on our curved arrows and drawing one four and one two adducts 
let's move on to something a little quicker. Question five just asks you to get a whole set of dienophiles here. And it said, which one of these would be least reactive in a deals alder? Could anybody figure that one out? Which one of these is just. Which one of these would be the real loser when it comes to reactivity? Right, what were we looking for in a dienophile? Right, in order for a dienophile to be reactive, it needs to have an electron withdrawing group. All right, if we look at one, you can see that we have a dipole going this way and a dipole going this way. So we've got two electron withdrawing groups. In the next one, we have another electron withdrawing group here. In the next one, if you redraw it like this and you draw triple bond, then definitely you have a dipole going this way. Um, if you draw a nitro, and you should be able to draw the, the, um, the Lewis structure of a nitro group. Right? This is one of those functional groups I would have gone over with you in organic one. Right? Since we have a positive charge on the nitrogen, we can draw a resonance form where we have something that looks like this. So I'll draw the resonance form of the nitro, right? So you can clearly see it's electron withdrawn. So we have something that looks like this, right? We have a positive charge here. Um, so Yeah, so there we go. I knew I was missing something. So you can see that that's electron withdrawing, but we know that the lone pair on the methoxy group, we just saw this several times, right? That's electron donating, right? That's going to donate electron density. So a methoxy group is not an electron withdrawing group. It's an electron donating group. So everything else is electron withdrawing. All right, let's move on to number six. Which one of the following dienophiles would be the most reactive? Anybody want to make a, a bet on this one? We're looking for an electron withdrawing group, something that's pulling electrons away. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be number three, isn't it? Right? You've got a dipole going this way and a dipole going this way. Heck yeah. This thing is uber reactive, our maleic anhydride. I told you that guy's really reactive. Everything else is kind of moderately reactive except for this one, which has an electron donating group, so that's going to be super unreactive. Great. Awesome. Let's try the next one. I think we did this one or something similar to it earlier today, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you can get some more practice on your curved arrows and your diels alder reaction. And so here we're going to end up with a derivative of 1,4-cyclohexane diene, which is this molecule here. And then we have our ester. There's no stereocenter in here because that uh, carbon is sp2 hybridized. Uh, the next one, again, in the same vein, if you're just like, what is this? It's just a Lewis, or it's just, you know, just not a condensed structure, right? The dienophile is nothing more than this, which we saw earlier on today. This and this are identical to each other. So again, I think we looked at something similar to this, maybe. I'm not sure. I can't remember all my doings and transpiring. So we end up with something that looks like this. We start by drawing our six membered ring up like this. We have a double bond down here. And we only broke one of those pi bonds. And so we're gonna have a pi bond here. And so there's no stereochemistry to even consider here. We end up with something that looks like this. Alrighty, let's keep cooking. The next one, we're starting out with cyclopentadiene, and we have our dienophile here, which has two substituents. Um, as far as the endo rule goes, if I circle this group in red and this group in blue, which one of those groups is going to be preferentially endo? Which one of those groups is going to end up in the endo position? It's only one of them. What was the rationale behind the endo rule? Anybody remember the endo rule? 
No, it's not the blue one. It's going to be the one in red because the one in red has a pie bond on it, right? And remember that the reason that something ends up in the endo position is because of a favorable interaction between the pi bond and the carbonyl group, the electron withdrawing group, and the pi bond that's being formed here. So it's going to be the group in red that's going to end up in the endo position. So we could draw some curved arrows, something, well, maybe I could draw something better than that. What is that? There we go, something like this. This and this, there we go. And so we end up with our five membered ring. Like that. Our six membered ring, here's our pi bond that we formed. And then the carbonyl group is going to end up in the endo position. The chlorine is going to end up pointing up like this. And of course, we're going to get the enantiomer of this compound as well. There we go. The next one, um, this is going to be our diene. Right, and this is going to be our dienophile. And so the reason they're saying excess, and of course, this is drawn in the S trans conformation, but we know that it's going to also, that's supposed to be an equilibrium arrow, we know that it's also going to exist in the S cis conformation, like this. And so what they're getting at is that since you have two strongly electron withdrawing groups here, right, this. This is going to be a very powerful dienophile here, and this side is going to be a powerful dienophile as well. So you end up with two deals, all the reactions occurring simultaneously. One on, uh, not my best artwork, one on this side, right? And then you're also going to end up with one on this side. So you're going to end up with one here, here, here. So you're going to form a six membered ring here, and then you're going to end up with another one here, here, and here. So you end up with a tricyclic compound in the end, all right? So what you're going to end up with, you draw the ring in the middle, right? Something like this. And then you're going to have a six-membered ring coming off of it like this. And then you're going to have another six-membered ring coming off on this side as well. There you go. And that's a meso compound, isn't it, right? That you're going to end up with, there's a plane of symmetry through that compound, anyhow, I wouldn't really quiz you anything on stereochemistry on a tricyclic like this. The next one, I think, is another one that I stole from the practice problems from before, so I'll go over this one kind of quickly. Cyclopentadiene reacting with maleic anhydride, right? I think we did this one earlier today. So we have our five-membered ring with our pi bond. Here's our six-membered ring, and remember, our maleic anhydride since you have a carbonyl here and a carbonyl here, those two pi bonds are going to be in the endo position. So if I move this maybe over here a little bit, it'd be easier for me to draw the endo position, which is going to look like this. So those pi bonds are kind of gross. There we go. It's not much better. All right. And of course, you have a proton pointing up here and a proton pointing up here. So remember the endo rule. All right. The last one, or this number 12, it says give the diene and the dienophile. So we get to draw the arrows for our retro Diels Alder, which is nothing more than this. Remember that these two groups are cis, so we end up with a cis alkene. So we end up with 1 3 butadiene as a dienophile, or diene, excuse me. And our dienophile is going to be this, where we have a carboxyl group here, oops, and a carboxyl group here. So there we go, a little retro deals alder action. Next one, same thing, what diene and dienophile. So again, we want to, it wouldn't matter which ring we drew the curved arrows on here. We're going to break the sigma bond, make a pi bond, and break this uh, bond and make a pi bond. So what are we going to end up with? We're going to end up with 1, 3 cyclohexane diene would be our, our diene. This is our diene and our dienophile would just be ethylene in this case, right? Because we're breaking this bond and this bond. The next one in the exact same vein, the endo rule is being shown here. So we draw curved arrow here, here, and here. Just draw a retro Diels alder. What do we end up with? Well, we end up with a dienophile that looks like this. So this is our dienophile. And our diene, again, is going to be one, three, cyclohexane diene, this guy here. 
we can fix those pie bonds. There we go. Okay, so a little more retro deals holder. And that takes us to the end of those problems.